She's an advocate for locating African American history in the Commonwealth. She was the chief patron for legislation that created a commission to study the impact of slavery and its long-term impact on African Americans in Virginia. In 2020, she introduced HJ 542 to study transit equity and modernize and examine the delivery of equitable transit service for the underserved. Bill McQuinn is an ordained minister and assistant pastor at her home church, New Bridge Baptist in Richmond, Virginia. She is an international speaker, exquisite orator, a critical thinker, a change maker, a progressive policy advocate, a Christian disciple and faith leader, a cancer and COVID-19 survivor, a wife, a mother, a very proud grandmother, a sister and friend. And always looking for ways to uplift and motivate others. Delegate McQuinn has created a paradigm shift in the Virginia General Assembly to focus on equity and positive change. Please welcome Delegate McQuinn, and I invite you to make your attendance of remarks. Thank you. Uh, as a result of um, 
of those of being under underserved population. And so, you know, we're going to you to kind of tell me the time because I keep rambling on. Um, but I, I, I think that if if we can move this forward, this two year study, uh, get many of the results that we're hoping will come from, from that, I think that we have an opportunity again to create a paradigm shift that would make transportation system available for all and not just looking at some things, but looking at everything from walkable communities, bikeable communities, and uh, communities that we believe uh, will serve uh, all of the citizens of our Commonwealth. So a pretty comprehensive approach. Yes. Yeah. And we'll dive a little deeper as we get to the Q&A between the, the panelists here. So thank you, Delegate. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Jacqueline Hopkins. Is a creative, strategic, and passionate leader who serves uh, as director of Equal Employment Opportunities (EEO) and Employee Relations for the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, properly known as SEPTA, in uh, Philadelphia. Since joining SEPTA in 2015, Jacqueline has been leading the organization's diversity, equity, and belonging initiatives in fostering transformative change. Please welcome. Welcome, Jacqueline, and I'd like to invite you to make your 10 minutes in the box. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, especially, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about ways that we can advance equity for employees. Um, like so many other organizations over the most recent, I would say, two years, um, we, you know, accept a, we kind of made a decision that it was time to get serious about employee engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we all dealt with the political and social unrest that came as a result of the police shootings and the polarizing elections that we had. Um, in addition to COVID-19 and the challenges that it brought, um, it's pretty much thrust us into a virtual workspace, and a lot of us are just unfamiliar with that. Um, so we knew it was time to get serious, and we wanted to create a work culture that uh, truly sees its employees and makes them feel included. And so we took a journey about a year and a half ago, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it. Um, mostly, I want you to get a sense of uh, how not very difficult a lift this is if you have organizational backing um, and a true desire for change. Um, first, I'll tell you a little bit about SEPTA. We have about 9,000 employees. 82% of our workforce are unionized. Um, a vast majority of them do not have email or any direct way for us to actually communicate with them. 67% are minorities and 22% are women. The first thing that we knew that we needed to do in order to create a vision for uh, having a more inclusive belonging environment was to actually launch a climate survey. And what we did was we looked at a number of metrics. We looked at trust, engagement, communication, psychological safety, um, voice, and a few other metrics. We used an outside vendor for that expertise, but internally we got together with a group and we built a survey. We built it based on best practices and also issues that were particular to SEPTA. The second part of this journey was at the same time that we were doing that, we formed an employee-led advisory council based on diversity, equity, and belonging. This council is actually made up of every group of employees, a representative from pretty much every group, um, including diverse background, job category, and level of management. We wanted union, non-union, um, we wanted managers and hourly, and we wanted at least 13 incredible employees who were passionate about change, who were passionate about SEPTA, and they were willing to serve, and we found that. Um, our employee uh, advisory board, they own and they champion all of our diversity initiatives, so they actually carry these initiatives to their respective departments. Um, and they liaise between the workforce and the executive staff on issues that concern the employees. And so this uh, piece of it, creating that council, was a really big step to getting the cultural buy-in that we needed in order to make change. The third thing that we did um, that I'm kind of particularly proud of is uh, we started a book club called Open Book. 
And it's a reading and discussion group based on um, any kind of difficult topic, anything that creates tension in the workplace, we wanted to tackle that. So we tackle topics such as unconscious bias, white supremacy, power, gender identity, neurodiversity, just to name a few, and we used books, TED Talks, and guest speakers for that. And we do that monthly. So uh, I'm happy to talk to any of you about how we did these things. Um, I want to encourage you, if you're interested in having a really strong diversity and inclusion program, it can be done. And I welcome your questions. Thank you. up in Richmond's east side and still calls the area home. She currently serves as the Director of Community Engagement for the RVA Rapid Transit, Virginia's only public transportation nonprofit which represents tra uh, transit riders. Welcome, Faith, and we look forward to your remarks. areas of transportation, technology, um, to be all in one room. It's, it's pretty phenomenal to learn from everyone. Um, I just want to ask a question about a show of hands. I mean, how many people have been in their field for more than five years? 10 years? 15? 20? Wow, 30? 40? 40? Okay, 50? Okay, so you need to know who you are and what you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you make well, I know him. You can go on for a while. <laughs> uh, I say all that to say is that there, there, there's power in this room. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of information. There's, a, there's hundreds of years combined experience. Um, and I'm honored to be in front of you guys today. Um, and what pretty much made you an expert in that field is time energy, education, um, how many people are still paying for that education right now. Um, but there's a lot of investment that has been made and made you the expert that you are right now. And so what I'd like to do is introduce you to Martin Hill. Martin Hill, uh, I met him in front of um, a McDonald's at Southside Plaza. My goal is in um, engaging and interacting with everyday bus riders. Um, this is about 11 o'clock in the middle of the day. He was with his um, son. Uh, Martin is a single white father. And he was explaining to me, because he had this grimace face, and I was like, well, oh, I don't know if I should walk up and talk to him. Um, but he was in deep thought. And as I started to talk to him, he really opened up. He really shared with me his story. And um, what his story was, he was saying that he had to pick up his son because his son had a bad experience, I guess, in um, and so he had to pick him up, and he was saying that he had been on the bus since 7.30 a.m. that morning. And um, he was frustrated because he really wished that there was um, a way that to get him to point A to point B within 15 minutes. But there isn't in our, in our city, especially on that corridor, that particular corridor. Um, he had been on the bus for four hours. He was, he was explaining that you know, my son doesn't understand that if he has a bad day, dad's going to have to pick him up. He doesn't understand that. But, you know, my job will not understand that. And so he had to pick up his son, and he's like, I was supposed to be at work at 9 o'clock this morning. It's 1130. I had to still drop him off where he needs to be. Luckily, he had a job that could work with him to drop him, his son off and come back. Um, so as you can imagine, Martin is an expert. He's an expert. Why? Because he told me he, he drove or uh, rode the bus for over 35 years in our city. Um, he knows, he can tell me on a certain corridor, he can tell me how many blocks are in between each bus stop and where they are. Um, I'm pretty sure that he's been and experienced a lot of different expansion projects throughout our city. Um, so he's an expert in his own right. And unfortunately, a lot of times experts like Martin are not introduced in a room like this. His voice is not heard very often. Um, and he has a lot of feedback to give when it comes to special projects or even where money should be invested in. And so um, 
We at RVA Rapid Transit are a nonprofit located in Richmond, Virginia. We're dedicated to frequent and far reaching public transportation within our region. Um, we believe that um, great public transportation allows people to live healthier lives, um, better interconnected lives. And so we want to do that. And um, what we've decided to do is we make sure that our efforts and our focus are people driven, what are people saying, versus a group of people who love transportation and want to see tra transportation change. Um, let's actually talk to people who the decisions that are affected by the most, what's their dialogue? What do they want? What do they want to um, see in their community or their neighborhood? And so we created a system called the Writer's Voice. And so what um, we've been doing is interviewing people throughout our city when it comes to different topics and issues. Um, we've been able to take the, that feedback and use it in uh, public comments. A lot of times, there are blanket statements made, hey, we have public comments available for you. But somebody like Martin Hill may not understand that you have to go to the Plan RBA's website first to get to the CBTA comments. Does he even know what the CBTA is? Probably not. And so um, our goal and our mission is to make sure that we can put those comments, that feedback into those spaces. Uh, we've been able to take that comments and feedback to, to create op-eds, uh, where to just bring more awareness to an issue, um, but also we've been able to use that feedback in different TOD studies. So right now there's um, talk for a certain corridor north south within our region. Where should it go? Should it go up Hull Street? Should it go down the Lothian? Should it go up Route One? So engaging people directly, getting getting their feedback on where this should go and how it affects them is so important. And um, and then. I was told how to do that, I told you guys how to do that. Well, it may look different. As I'm finding out, we are the only um, transit writer focused nonprofit in our region, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, I would recommend definitely, like, who are your advocates? Who are the transportation advocates? Who are the environmental advocates? Getting that direct feedback, um, pushing for op eds to bring more awareness in essays. Um, and then most importantly, why is it important to do that? I think it's important because it shows other people the other side of the coin. I showed you, showed you or shared your story today. Um, our role is to amplify those stories. Now a bunch of folks from all parts of our city or our um, state have heard Martin Hill's story. So that's the number one way to amplify, to share it, to get it out. Um, but it, it shows you what it's like to catch a bus that way. Um, I mean, I know I connected to him in some a certain way because I'm a single parent. I, I, I know if my daughter is um, having a bad day at school, I know I can drive in my car, I can go get her, I can drop her off at my mom's house, and I can be done within an hour. And I do have a job that allows me to do that. But for somebody like Mark Hill, who's, who's on an a hour to hours and not on salary like myself, him missing four to five hours in a day completely affects his entire paycheck, affects whether or not he can pay his rent. So just, I mean, we can talk about frequency, that's an issue, but now we have a story behind it. And so it's important for us to have that connection to me. Um, but then also those types of stories and essays, if you hear them, they also inspire people. So I hope his story inspired you today, um, inspired you to um, create ways in the organization where you can get, can get that direct feedback like Jack, Jacqueline has with employees. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> focus 
for us at WMATA, uh, along with WMATA General Manager and CEO Paul Wiedefeld, I presented a transit equity framework to the board in July of 2020. This provided a roadmap for where the board was going to focus on policy, policing, public uh, participation, fair, service, sustainability, contracting, and performance reporting. WMATA well, managers have held several agency-wide meetings with a focus on leadership and equity. These meetings were a good opportunity to reaffirm WMATA's commitment to equity across the organization. As many others nationally and regionally also did, WMATA uh, commemorated Juneteenth as a federal holiday for its employees. WMATA has and will continue to be committed to civil rights, Title VI, making sure that no person is denied benefits based on race, color, or national origin. And in the areas of policing, the WMATA board created a Metro Transit Police Investigation Review Pen. This is an independent advisory body that can, be, that can recommend changes to training and policies. Uh, this was one of the first actions the board took uh, in its review of the equity matters. WMATA continues to work with our disadvantaged and minority business enterprise, uh, DEB and MEB programs. They have an aim to, or we have an aim to increase the share of minority and women-owned businesses that compete and participate in business opportunities with WMATA. The metro rail system often gets all the attention, but there, we have very much, again, detailed focus on metro bus as well. We have a bus transformation project uh, that was initiated to look at the entire system from the top to the bottom, and it is the plan to transform bus in the region and improve service and customer experience for all riders. Creating a bus system that is affordable, equitable is one of our goals. WMATA continues to work with its funding partners on an action plan that uh, has been developed. Some actions are already underway, but the implementation and most recommendations will will occur in steps over the next decade. The Metro Access Paratransit system is also important to serve our customers with disabilities and prevent them from riding, uh, or, uh, or an them from riding from uh, rail or bus. Some recent improvements include the addition of comfortable sedans to the fleet, offering free trips as an alternative service, such as Uber or a local taxi, and allowing customers to select their vehicle preference. We have also made numerous accessibility improvements through the rail and bus systems, including all low floor bus fleets, warning uh, tiles on the, uh, at the rail stations, and improving station lighting and improved fare rates. The final topic I'd like to mention is, the, is affordable housing. This is certainly a major challenge throughout the Commonwealth, but especially here in Northern Virginia and in Washington, D.C. region. Jurisdictions are making progress in this area, and some have set actual requirements for affordable housing and developments or redevelopments. One recent strategy in this region is in Montgomery County, Maryland, to accelerate construction of new housing and to address the increased costs associated with maintaining transit uh, access at active metro stations in October 2020. The Montgomery County Council enacted legislation uh, to provide a 15 year property tax abatement for new development on the Wilmot owned property of the county. To qualify, the development must be at least 50% housing and must consist of high-rise construction or uh, of at least eight stories. On the federal side, the House uh, Reconciliation Bill creates a new $10 million affordable housing access program, which will, which will be jointly administered by HUD and the FTA. It would support projects that provide access to affordable housing, improving mobility for low-income riders, and enhance access to job and educational opportunities and community services. Affordable housing is also uh, on our mind at WMATA, and we are very pleased that uh, we have a very interesting and uh, rewarding uh, partnership, we hope, uh, has been reached with uh, Amazon. Many of you have probably heard that the news that Amazon uh, has committed $125 million in this region to, uh, to finance delivery of 100 new affordable housing units by the end of 2025. This financing is available only for WMATA joint project um, or, or development partners and goes directly to them. For example, uh, not too far from here, the West Falls Church Metro Station Joint Development Project in Fairfax County will be eligible for these funds. This is an exciting opportunity because it focuses on equitable transit-oriented development to reach housing production and affordability targets. 
Housing and transportation are typically the, the two largest cost expenditures for households. Commuting on transit is less expensive than by car, but housing is often more expensive near transit stations. This collaboration breaks the cycle by supporting the creation of additional affordable housing at metro stations on land owned by Metro. Metro looks forward to this partnership with Amazon, and that will begin, uh, and we hope to, that we'll, you know, all of you will take uh, advantage of this uh, in the future. So let's get to some of the questions um, for the panel. Uh, so Delegate, you have a very important role in that general assembly. You chair the Transportation Committee. Tell us what the reaction has been like from your members, your fellow delegates. What you, you put together this great bill, mm -hmm. these are laudable goals. I think we have a lot of people in the room that could possibly help in your efforts in, <laughs> to, to get this bill passed. So, so I'm curious, given the diversity of the General Assembly, what has been the response from your fellow colleagues? Um, the reality is that it was received unanimous support from the House and the Senate. And it's been almost as if people were waiting for this opportunity. In terms of the transportation for the state of Virginia, and we've been progressive in some ways. But there are these, I guess, if you would consider them holes or voids, as I spoke earlier about the ADA community. You spoke about Martin and those uh, challenges that some more underserved population based on the locality or based on geographically, but they'd be, that'd be the hit and miss. And I think that, but the, it, it, as a whole, the General Assembly was very supportive of this. And you hear, you know, once you start talking about this, and we had this particular piece of legislation, and we began to have conversations about it, you could hear across the Commonwealth that people had great concerns. Now, I'm not even going to talk about Northern Virginia, but there was great concerns across the board about how important this is, uh, how uh, the, the, the fact that had the inequity issues or inequity challenges that we are facing across the Commonwealth, it affects all of your life. It, 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 it is about a, a quality of life issue. I mean, because you talked about housing, you talked about other things that are going on here, but across uh, uh, the Commonwealth, you know, time is a big issue, and when you have the challenges and the inequity issues and challenges in terms of transportation or not having, or accessibility, they create problems. And so it was a, a uh, very engaged conversation from across the board and across the Commonwealth about uh, those uh, missed opportunities that we had uh, to serve all the constituents, constituency of the Commonwealth. And so I was very pleased with the support. Uh, but Martin, there's a Martin in every corner of the Commonwealth. Uh, and those are the individuals that we are trying to connect with so that, again, the issue of affordability and accessibility, that we can, if we can get that right, we would have accomplished a lot. Thank you. Jacqueline, you, you mentioned you have a lot going on within the organization itself with employee committees and stuff like that. But we have several executive directors and directors here. Uh, what was the reaction of the set the board and the elected officials in Philadelphia to this you know, initiative that you were pursuing? Yeah, I made a, a brief reference to having organizational uh, support. And when we set off on this journey, the board did that by electing their own oversight committee to the board, made up of people in the community. Um, some of them are ex Eagles football players. <laughs> um, some of them are just really well known, um, well established businessmen and attorneys in the, in the city of Philadelphia. And they came together to oversee the sector board's efforts. Um, and to support it. And so we got a tremendous um, perception to the ideas that we had for this advisory council. They wanted to know about it. They wanted to know what was going into it. And then when the council members were selected, they wanted to meet them. So all across the board, from the very top, um, we got the support that was needed. For the directors or executive, executive directors out here, what is your biggest struggle in Communication, the communication pipeline to the essential workers, the people who were actually out there driving the community around, we were, it, it was very hard to reach them. Even to get them to respond to the survey was very, very challenging. 
One of the things that we learned through this process, though, was how to get in front of our employees. The best way to do that was, other than physical presence, going out to the locations, going through your direct supervisors, we learned, getting them in, involved, getting their buy-in and their support for what we were doing, meeting with them to talk about it, answering their questions. Not all of them were really 100% um, open because they didn't understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion really meant. Some people hear that as a divisive thing or potentially problematic things. So we had to meet with supervisors. And so if we went out to one of our biggest sites, for instance, um, it's a location called Midvale. And Midvale has our largest, um, it's our, our largest bus and uh, trolley station. And so when we went out there, we knew we were talking to supervisors who have a, you know, a large swath of our employees and we wanted their time and we wanted them to understand what we were doing. Um, and so just making sure that the people who were directly dealing with our frontline employees, those are the ones that actually have their trust. Um, part of what we learned in the survey when they answered questions like who do you trust, who do you actually think has your best back, or who has your best interest, we learned that the further apart the hierarchy got away from um, our hourly employees, the, the less likely they were to trust. So if you were an executive, they didn't trust you, they didn't know you, and they didn't think that you understood what they needed. Um, if you were their direct supervisor, they tended to trust you. And so it was a very important lesson on how to reach our employees by going through the direct supervisor and then also physically getting out there in front of them. Hey, viewers, like you play such an important role. And yeah, we've seen that in the last 18 months, you know, the messages and how you communicate that. So what, what's, your, what's your strategy, if you will, to educate people like Kelly and Quinn and others leaders that are sitting here yeah. What's, what's your approach? Um, how do you go about educating folks about the markets and all that? Um, opportunities like this, um, continually sharing the story. We've, um, our organization has transit talks and we meet monthly, and uh, we have an opportunity for people to continue to hear those stories so we can invite them on. Um, our website, we list a lot of those stories. We create um, it's me actually walking up to people and recording their voice. And so we put that to pictures and videos and sending it out that way. Um, another way we do that is one-on-one -on -one meetings with different, um, with different board of supervisors or city council meetings. Hey, this is what um, this person in your district is saying. Um, so there's many ways that we do that. So Delian, we at Wallada, as I said earlier, are really looking at things very differently now because mm -hmm. Our big blockers here telling us, you know, hey, you need to listen to us. Here's what it's been like for us in these last, you know, 18 months and decades in some cases. Uh, so reliability, frequent service, things like that. So you have this bill, you have some success. Now, what's what's the next step? We're now that we've learned what we've learned over these last several months, mm -hmm. and we're at this point now. Of reflection. What, where, where do we go from here? Where do you go from here? Given again, given your role, what, what do you see as your priority going into the next legislative session to advance things? Let me say, first of all, the premise of this particular House Joint Resolution was that every citizen of our Commonwealth should be have, are entitled to a safe environment, uh, accessible. Uh, Transportation that's accessible, transportation that's affordable. So as we move forward to the next, uh, you know, in, in light of COVID and, and Trump hopefully getting past that, that the re there's will be an initial report, the initial report that will come to us in December, and that will give us an opportunity to, to assess, you know, what they, you know, what came out of all of the investigation, out of the research, out of looking at all of uh, opportunities like um, the one that you had, those situations, all those things that would uh, help us to address the issue of safety, the issue of accessibility, the issue of affordability, uh, even uh, infrastructure, those reports will come back to us and then we'll have an opportunity to assess that and say, okay, where do we go from here? 
But I believe that all of this report, just based on what the preliminary discussions that I've had, that there are going to be some great information that say, these are where the gaps are. This is a gap. Uh, COVID-19, again, opened the, you know, it just opened the floodgate to some of the challenges that we're dealing with and magnify them in a way that no one can close their eyes to. You know, you can't hide and say it didn't happen. And so I think based on that, um, uh, that situation as, long, as well as other research and investigation that has been done into these many facets of transportation, I think that it will give us some clear uh, 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 paper orders to move to another place in these areas that you know that they are going. And we know what they are basically, but you can see it in black and white so people can believe what they yeah. see more. Yeah, I think people, <laughs> people intellectually know at some level yes. what the issues are, but now yes. they, yes. they just said they're 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 and they're being forced to acknowledge that yes. and deal with that. And so find is, some resources, and we have some coming, but yeah, so that's it's, it's, it's one of the challenges is the cost, but we've got to address these things. I think a lot of years have been picked up on their resources. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Jack, Jack, what about um, you know, next steps for something. You have this information, you have these communities, you have your communication packages, your educational tools. As I mentioned, you know, I think our bus transformation project and some of the other things a lot of done has been informed by what we've learned over the last 18 months. So what's next for SEPTA? Are, you know, are they going to use this information and use these new relationships with their writers and employees to to do something new, do things differently. How, you know, what, do, what do you think that is like for your organization? Yeah, for us, um, all of the climate survey effort was uh, specifically to get to a strategic plan. A strategic plan that, you know, addressed whatever came out of that climate survey. And so when I mentioned to you the indices that we were measuring, trust, communication, inclusion, voice, and all of that, when we got the results back a couple of months ago, I think it was May, um, we learned that the three lowest indices, we call them areas of opportunity, um, the three lowest were trust, inclusion, and voice. And we were able to look at those scores. We can break them down by department and of course by demographic. We can look at, we can, I can draw up in my mind, I'd like to know what um, an employee who's in management who identifies as you know, queer or gay, how do they perceive their opportunities for advancement here at SEPTA? I can actually ask myself that question and go to the data and look at it. So what we've done is we've developed an 18 month strategic plan based off of those three lowest um, indices and we're targeting those. Um, we're basically building programs to go out and touch point with the, with the locations on a consistent basis. We're also looking at developing some groups, not necessarily ERGs, but groups that will bring um, employees together based on common interests. Um, and also, we're looking at some programs down the line as part of the 18 month plan. And so I would highly recommend if you're gonna collect data, if you're going to be measuring and getting all of these responses, you have to follow that up with some sort of a strategic plan. It has to be transparent, it has to be published to the, the workforce. They have to know that you're serious about what it is you're, you're doing. So good. <laughs> You've got a good job, and uh, I think in this next stage, uh, this sort of reckoning and understanding of, hey, we, we've got to address things and we have to look at things differently. So how do you see your work changing? I'm not going to say a challenge necessarily, but how do you how do you see your work changing and the way you maybe communicate or uh, you know how how do you take it to that next step given the opportunity that is before? Awesome. Or, you know, you know, you know, really well I just want to say Paul is not on script right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good question. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> Next is creating a writer's council. So we're collecting a whole, we'll write 
Um, someone like Mark Neal, who has the intention of training the first 35 years, who's an expert. And so what we want to do is create a core group of people that can provide that feedback um, and get them in front of persons like Don't Get Quit and things like that. And so we will get a town hall shortly. So, um, so situations like that. <laughs> so um, I think um, that's the next step. That's the next step. Well, the next step is getting it out of the calendar, right? <laughs> 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 well, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we do have time. We're, we're ahead. I think we're, we, we can take some questions. But I think the one thing for me, some takeaway is, you know, we've all learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I think access, frequency, you know, those are some things that I think we keep hearing about. As she said, there are these spots or pockets, you know, and it really learned again in the last 18 months and those things that they amplify and, you know, fairness and distribute people distribution. I think those are some of the themes that have come out of this and it's something that obviously every system in here, regardless of where they are, an urban setting, a small urban setting, or a rural, everyone has to look and examine that. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and take a few questions. <laughs> Uh, if you could keep, you know, just ask a question. We don't have time to uh, have, you know, a five minute meeting for the question. So, uh, is there anyone? Sir. Question, yeah. Hi, this is for uh, Delegate Quinn. Uh, could could you stand up? Yeah, sir. Yeah. That's my thing. Don't pick on me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to first, I would say, congratulate you on your hard work for um, you. getting this bill across. It's extremely important what you're doing. Um, as we know, infrastructure is one big piece of increasing mm -hmm. equity. Um, I know right now at the RPT they have the TRIP program, which is providing a good amount of operating assistance for fare free service, among other things. Yes. Something here at Frederick we're applying for, or hopefully we'll be getting it. What would help us the most would be more operating funding from the state level. My question is are there any plans and the, de the delegates at the state level to provide more operating funding for um, transit agencies? That would help us provide more equity. And in turn, with the infrastructure part of the equity modernization study, I think it will compound each other and make that uh, investment in the infrastructure even greater. Thank you for your time. Yeah, you're, you're so welcome. Um, and thank you for your question. Yes, that is something that we are absolutely discussing. And I know you shared with GRTC, and Julia is here somewhere from GRTC. And they, as a result of COVID, you shared that the bus fares became zero fares that was uh, and we're going to look at and talking about how we continue that right now so I know that the General Assembly will certainly be um, looked upon to help support those kind of efforts and I I strongly believe that we have support there um, to uh, to help address it from that perspective so we're going to keep chiseling at it and we need as we go into 2022 to have this kind of conversation, an individual like yourself to come to help support those efforts. Great, thank you. Okay. Ma'am, I'm going to first. Thank you for your comments. I really enjoyed this panel. I have a question for Jacqueline. What was your return of, of when you sent out the survey to your employees? What was the return rate? And do you feel like that helped with morale? It was 27% return rate, and we fought so hard for it. <laughs> it was so hard. Uh, we initially planned to roll the survey out for one month and just, you know, have people have it open for a month. It was a, 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 a web-based uh, survey where everyone was given the QR code that they can scan and go straight into the survey and they can answer it. So we only got 27%. Um, based on our numbers, that put us within a margin of error that was comfortable for us, and so we knew that we had a statistically significant amount of responses to go forward. Um, but it was not uh, easy because of the lack of trust um, that we had. And so what it did for morale remains to be seen because uh, at Philly employees are tough anyway. They just want to see something come out of all of this. You know, they'll go ahead and answer the questions, but there's really no way to say that morale has increased because of the survey until people are, you know, surveyed again in 18 months and we want to see the needle move. But we already know our workforce and we know that what they really want is to see results. We knew the survey was important because asking questions helps <laughs> when you when the employees know that you care enough to ask these questions 
but the results matter the most. Sir, you go next. Yes, I also have a question for Jacqueline. Um, you mentioned that one of the areas of focus from the survey results would be uh, looking at giving employees voice uh, in the organization, yet you prefaced your comments by saying something like 95% of the employees don't have an email account. Isn't that an opportunity to give them more direct access to both receiving information from SEPTA but also giving them voice? Yes, great question. Um, an internal question that we ask ourselves initially. And um, I don't know how many other trans agencies that are here that are as highly unionized as SEPTA, but one of the challenges we had, even with email, was they have contracts that actually specify that if you started sending them emails, you'd have to pay them to read the email. So there's a there are structural <laughs> and contractual um, concerns that made it really difficult. And so we, we just knew that we had to go back old school and really be present. <laughs> that presence really matters the most, especially for our frontline folks. Benny. Um, this is a question for the whole panel and actually for the whole room. One of the dilemmas I face or we face in Monmouth County is, and this is true of any of our kinds of systems, is you hear from the riders who are participating already, but how do you reach those that are not using your transit system? I know that there are many people in Monmouth County that probably could use them, the transit system, but don't know how or we're not touching them or not reaching out to them appropriately. Any suggestions on that would be very helpful. Any, any suggestions on how to reach non-riders or people who are engaged in riders? Absolutely. Uh, reach out to organizations they belong to. Um, who, are, who are off the ground for? Who are they comfortable talking to? Um, and so whether that be someone in the faith community, whether that's someone environmentally, whether that's someone in a senior living home, why are you not catching bus? Why are you not using public transportation? So, reaching out to those organizations who have contact with those people and allowing them to build that connection. So I'll hand it over here, and this will be our last question. Yeah. Thank you all so much for what you have to say. The one thing that struck me as you talked about the two different things, you mentioned there needs to be a paradigm shift from mindset. We're from the South of Orange, you all are here in the North, we don't have that huge ridership like you do. Can you give some pointers on how we can make something like that begin to go into the minds that public transportation means public transportation, including private groups and corporate, that they will be willing to ride it and not look at it as something that's only for the underrepresented? <laughs> Sorry, it's a hot breath of fresh air. No, <laughs> I just, I just for clarification, want to be clear about what you said. You said you live in a, a different area, more rural area, is that what you're saying? Well, more so, than up here in Northern Virginia. And okay. I'm saying, like how everyone is cool to get on your trains and so forth. It's not as cool that way. Mm -hmm. But it is needed because you all are mentioning, like Mackenzie mentioned, environmental trends, looking at how it impacts the quality of life. Mm -hmm. What is the way, what are some pointers that you can give us that we can take back to begin to make that paradigm shift? Sure, okay. They can think a little different and join what's happening up this way. One of the, the, the things that I, and I keep saying over and over in my head, how do we move people and not vehicles? How do we how do we begin to market uh, the the cool part of riding something other than driving at cars? How do we how do we begin to uh, and I guess from every aspect and and get into even how we get additional ridership? We're just going you know we're going to have to sell sing a different song and a different tune because I know even myself. Whenever I've got to go from one place to the other, I jump in my car and I'm gone. Yeah. And, and I begin to think about, I need to jump on the bus every now and then and, and get to from point A to point B. So I just think that we're going to have to, you know, a, good, a great marketing um, uh, uh, 
way to market people moving rather than vehicles moving for the benefit of the, the environment, for the benefit of, of, of socializing, not so much right now, but socializing, uh, all the benefit, the great benefit of people, you know, moving from one point to, from point A to point B, rather than vehicles as much as we have done in this common Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. And I want to say thank you to Ms. Hopkins, Ms. Walker, and Delegate McQuinn for participating here today. It was really great. And we all had a lot of work to do. We've all been educated a lot in those last 18 months, but now we have a lot of work to do. So thank you for that. And I'm sure all of you have a lot of work to do as well in this area. So I want to take an opportunity just to say there will be an ice cream break. Um, Right. So, second. second floor, ice cream bay. So uh, be sure to visit the exhibitors during the break and pick up your prize tickets. And thank you for everyone uh, listening to our three speakers today. Please give them a round.